name is Pavel. In CLDB, I've spent some time improving the IO subsystem in this sister uh, and discovered some interesting things about how SSDs work. So my talk is going to be about the most important uh, takeaways from that work. Uh, before diving into details, let me meet the uh, main character of this play, the SSD, and how it's thought to differ from its opponent, the HDD. Since HDDs appeared first, we'll start with them. Uh, it's well known that an HDD is a set of spinning plates and the head with a server that positions it, it over the needed location over the plate stack. Uh, each input-output operation potentially involves the head movement, uh, which is often referred to as uh, a SIG. This SIG is the central point of programmer's care or headache. Uh, when talking about typical SIG times, the millisecond scale is in use, uh, and it's well comparable with the typical data transfer time. Uh, this comparability means that uh, if you forget about the fact uh, that the head needs to move and just read from and write to the plates, uh, you may easily make your I.O. performance times worse than it could be. Respectively, uh, the way to handle the sick time carefully includes two recipes, uh, both coming from the try hard not to move the head restriction. Uh, do sequential I.O. as much as possible and prefer larger I.O. buffers over smaller. Uh, by the way, a good example of applying this uh, rule comes from the database world. Uh, almost every database out there has a thing called uh, commit log. And the commit log was invented and designed keeping the aforementioned principle uh, in mind. Next, they appeared the SSDs, uh, and they were really uh, met very warmly because uh, under the hood, they looked pretty much like a regular RAM uh, with uh, all data cells being accessed at theoretically the same time. Uh, in other words, one of their expected benefits was that I.O. Uh, could finally be done without much thinking about buffer size and without any care of the sick time. Uh, but now let's uh, take a closer look at an imaginary SSDs we're going to work with. Uh, other than the disk capacity itself, uh, there are four the most important numbers about the disk, uh, its speed. Uh, this speed has four components, uh, two throughputs and two IOPS. Uh, both are for reading and for writing, thus four. Uh, the larger these numbers are, the faster the disk is, right? Uh, well, actually, uh, not quite, uh, and that's why. The trick is that those four speeds are, of course, uh, those measured with perfectly prepared I.O. under perfectly selected conditions. In real usage scenarios, there is a bunch of uh, often unavoidable options uh, that slow down the disk and the I.O. Uh, so let's move on and take a closer look at each. The most known item from the above list is the overwriting problem, uh, also known as erasure problem, which means the inability to overwrite a single I.O. block. Uh, this limitation comes from the internal or organization of the flash memory inside SSDs. The minimal read or write unit of an SSD is called a page, and its size varies between 1 and 16 Ks, but maybe today a bit larger. Uh, but in order to write to a page that was already written to previously, SSD needs to wipe or erase this page first. And this erasure operation only works on blocks. Uh, which consists of uh, 100 or 200 of pages, power of two, of course. Uh, to make uh, SSDs look like generic block storages, uh, there is a controller inside the SSD which maintains a built-in indirection level. Uh, this level maps sector of sets from the user-provided requests to the physical sector of set inside the real flash memory. 
Needless to say that uh, maintaining this indirection table steals performance from the user I.O. on the regular basis. Uh, said that, it becomes uh, clear, maybe not completely, but clearer, uh, why those four speeds of an SSD are often much larger than those uh, one may observe on its uh, Grafana plots, right? Uh, the disk becomes older, uh, just like us, uh, this aging spoils the indirection table, which in turn may result in suboptimal use of the flash lanes. Another annoyance of this aging is the need to run a garbage collection over this table from time to time, uh, which disturbs the user I.O. even worse than just making a plain lookup over it. Is there anything that can be done about it? Uh, well, yes. Uh, the greatest surprise is that sequential I.O. with larger buffer should probably still be preferred. Also, this time the justification for that rule somewhat differs. Another piece of advice is to help the SSD understand which parts uh, of it shouldn't be taken care of uh, by this indirection level layer. Uh, the latter is done with the help of trim command uh, that can be sent to the disk. Uh, from a user perspective, uh, this is often transparent uh, thanks to file systems code yeah, in the kernel. Uh, but, time signed, but sometimes uh, an application may want to run FI trim IOCTLA CTL over, over a file it works with. Time to move on and find out uh, a bit more what the mentioned throughput and IOPS really mean for SSD. Uh, other than the page versus block structure, uh, SSD have much more transistors inside. Uh, one of the widely used extension is the cache placed in front of the, of the flash cells. Uh, working with cache deserves its own talk, uh, but for the sake of this one, it's enough to mention that it exists at all. Uh, and it's, of course, faster and smaller uh, than the main flash memory. It's pretty much uh, obvious how writing into cache uh, can speed things up. Uh, on reads, uh, this cache uh, may also help. Uh, by reading more data from the flash that was requested uh, in the hope that the next read uh, would hit the adjacent data. Uh, this uh, optimization uh, is known as read ahead. Uh, another important feature of uh, SSD is that, uh, that we've slightly touched already is called internal parallelism. Uh, when reading or writing a large amount of data, even with a single request, uh, it may happen that different parts of this request get into different and parallel processing lanes inside the drive. Uh, and deliberately making a request to hit more than one lane is not always possible. In particular, aged out disk may have such a disturbed indirection table that even a request that covers many pages or even blocks still maps into a, into a single lane. Having said that, it becomes clear uh, that when using several similar uh, requests in a row, they can be served at drastically different speeds depending on whether they were served from cache or at a level they managed to utilize the disk's internal parallelism facility. Of course, when doing requests rarely and in short batches, it's more likely that, we, that they will enjoy the mentioned optimizations and keeping the I.O. for longer time without giving the disk time to take a breath will likely make lots of this I.O. go the slowest route possible. Needless to say that uh, advertised disk speeds I mentioned previously are most likely the burst ones. And unfortunately, there is not much that can be done here if the goal is to improve the sustained I.O. Of course, all the advices from the previous section applies here too. Uh, other than those, uh, the best thing to do here is to re-evaluate the drive before using it and get the performance numbers for the sustained load and make all the further calculations based on them. It's more relevant uh, than it's thought to be. Uh, the thing is that different SSD models handle requests of different sizes differently. Uh, 
I know that it's a very generic statement that's hard to argue, but still, uh, let's make a mind experiment. Uh, what if we uh, load a disk with the smallest requests possible, uh, say 1K? Uh, in this case, the maximum number of the requests processed by the disk will be limited uh, by the ability of the disk and the bus to process the requests themselves. This limit is called IOPS. Now, what if we use the largest request possible, or well, maybe not possible, but meaningful, say a few megs in size? In this case, the maximum number of requests processed will be limited by the ability of the system to process data, uh, not to request themselves. Uh, this limit is in turn called the throughput. And the most interesting thing here is uh, what happens if we use some intermediate request size, say tens to hundreds of Ks? Uh, the answer is surprisingly how I stated it before. Different disks will behave differently. Uh, the expectation is usually that either of the limits would win. Either we hit the IOPS limit uh, or we hit the throughput limit. Uh, actually, some disks show a performance gap uh, let's call it like this, uh, on such medium sized requests. Neither the maximum request rate is reached, nor the data processing capacity is fulfilled, but disks can, disk cannot do more. If your application tries to squeeze as much throughput from the disk as possible, or as much IOPS as possible, uh, you should carefully measure the minimal request size that can achieve the throughput, uh, and the maximum request size that can achieve maximum IOPS. Sometimes it can be a surprising number. Uh, however, some good news is that if you uh, double the buffer size or half it, uh, most likely the disk will scale linearly. Uh, I mean, it will uh, take exactly two uh, times more time or two times less time uh, to process it. Okay, uh, so we are done with the I.O. in general. Let's see what can go wrong uh, when we start telling reads from writes. First go writes. Uh, when writing a data to a disk, one should remember that it can be cached at several levels. Uh, first, the application that, for example, tries to use large sequential I.O. Uh, may collect some data in memory before writing it out. Uh, next, Linux kernel has a quite elaborated disk cache subsystem called page cache uh, that also keeps data in memory before sending it uh, to the disk. And finally, as I've mentioned, uh, the disk itself uh, may cache the data internally. Caching at any level uh, most often serves the purpose of improving the write performance, sometimes reads, uh, but it comes at the reliability cost, potential cost. If the cache is lost, the data is likely lost as well. To control the way uh, Linux and disk cache the data, there are two handles exposed to the application. Uh, first, the file can be opened with the O direct flag. Uh, it's a well-known flag. Uh, it will mean that the Linux page cache will be emitted during I.O. Uh, next, there comes a uh, less known flag, uh, a disk caching knob called odsync. Uh, well, actually, there is the osync flag too, which controls metadata synchronization, but uh, let's keep it aside. Uh, so the odsync flag means that each submitted I.O. will be acknowledged by the disk uh, after the data is really written into a power independent medium, uh, and this flag does affect the way disk consumes writes. Uh, applications that care data integrity use, use it or play with F-Sync, F-Data Sync system calls, uh, which in the end has the same effect. Uh, the disk is asked to flash, flash the data. Surprisingly, or maybe not, uh, there are disks that effectively ignore the flashing request uh, by providing the same safety safety, uh, and performance regardless of it. Uh, these are good disks. Uh, all the cloud providers we've checked use them, uh, so it's safe and fast 
uh, to use or desync flag. However, there are disks that uh, suck a great deal when they try to serve flashing requests. These are not so good disks uh, because the latency difference can be measured in thousand times, really. Uh, so if the data safety is in priority, whether the disk is or desync friendly or not, it must be studied carefully before starting to use that disk. Okay, uh, mixed workload, my favorite part. Uh, did you notice that uh, four performance numbers I'm always referring to are about pure reads and pure writes? Uh, it's silently assumed that when doing reads and writes at the same time, uh, the disk would, let's say, combine them linearly. Uh, or maybe it was not expected that anyone would do reads and writes at the same time, uh, but that's unlikely. Uh, actually, uh, the way disks handle reads and writes uh, competing with each other depends on the concurrency of both streams. Uh, by concurrency here, I literally mean the number of requests of either kind sitting uh, in the disk. Uh, for example, if the con 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 concurrency is low, then writes are clearly preferred over reads. If under pure read workload, disk may need uh, something about 100 microseconds to serve a read request, then the very same read request will require up to a millisecond to be served uh, if it will try to compete with, a, with at least one write. Uh, at the same time, uh, the latency of serving write requests may not change at all or become few percent larger. Increasing the capacity of reads always helps, uh, even if the concurrency of writes increases as well. Uh, in the extreme case, it's possible to make reads and writes share the disk throughput equally, but this usually requires quite high concurrent streams. Uh, so if you will try to measure the peak mixed bandwidth, you'll need to saturate the disk with high concurrent streams uh, and most likely uh, wouldn't notice this effect. Uh, some bad news is that there is not much that can be done about it as well. Uh, it's the same as trying to write data at higher speeds than disk actually can handle. Uh, nonetheless, uh, if you are warned, then you are armed. Uh, knowing that the disk behaves like that may help improving the latency of requests. Uh, for example, in Scylla, uh, we have an I.O. scheduler uh, on the C-star level uh, that keeps requests in the queue before submitting them to disk uh, to, be able to be able to prioritize them. Uh, teaching the scheduler with that knowledge uh, that write, that reads become slower when they compete uh, with writes, uh, allow it to keep the request latencies under control. Uh, so that's it. Uh, that's all I have. 